Last time, you guys gave us some ideas as to you know, why we might want to do restoration, what might be some of the motivations, and that was great. Um, uh, a whole variety of motivations could spark the initial interest in restoration ecology. Um, in general, we have this problem of uh, reduced, uh, of humans messing with the landscape, the seascape, whatever the case may be, right? And so we might outright destroy something or we might degrade something. And restoration can be used in, in either uh, of those contexts. But most, off, most conspicuously would be something like we have some introduced species, an organism that um, wouldn't otherwise be there if it weren't for human uh, activities. And that could be not just species, it could also be something else physically. Maybe we armored the coast. Maybe we, we dumped some landfill into the wetlands, so, something like that. Uh, or processes. By processes, I'm talking about the goings on of an ecosystem. So how energy moves through the system, how, how, um, how uh, material moves through the system, that kind of stuff. Very often when we ask about things, I, when I ask you guys to characterize a system, describe a system, you guys tend to talk about the organisms, the stuff we can easily, see, stuff we can take a picture of with a camera, right? And that's totally cool, and that's, that's a, a natural place to start. But realize restoration deals with much more than just the organisms. It deals with the organisms, how they interact on the landscape, how they interact with the other, you know, the, the living, with the non-living elements, all of that. All of that falls in the purview of ecological restoration. And indeed, focusing on but, a so, but one subcomponent of that is almost always a recipe for disaster. We have to understand these are, these are organic, dynamic, living systems. Um, so, but anyway, but we, we might do restoration because we have some invasive species, let's say. Um, another thing we might have would be an altered dis disturbance regime. So right now, across California, we have this huge issue with all these wildfires going, et cetera. So um, we could perhaps change the frequency of disturbance. We could make the place in question be tweaked more often or more intensely. Or we might remove that tweaking. So in the case of fire, we've removed, generally speaking, we've removed that element from the landscape um, over the last hundred odd years. And so, so either of those disturbance regimes, uh, uh, excuse me, ch changing disturbance regimes by either adding more or taking some away um, can both be bad. Another uh, important area that might motivate us to think about restoration would be um, not just maybe that, maybe not the particular site that we're speaking of, maybe this forest is okay, but maybe this forest used to be part of a much larger contiguous whole and now it's isolated. So we might use restoration to try to repair some of this fragmentation. So to add into the matrix, say between our forest plot and the forest plot on the other side of the county, something, something of that nature. And then uh, another very popular one, uh, I said before, you shouldn't just focus on, on, on species, but that's so oftentimes the initial motivator. But, um, and that's, that's not the end of the world, that's not horrible, but, but we need, need to acknowledge that that does happen. And so this is most typically with something very charismatic, a pretty eagle, um, a warm fuzzy fox, right? <laughs> something like that. So no, no, no ill will towards the warm fuzzy fox, but, but um, yeah. So oftentimes you need the warm fuzzy fox to get people to, get, to pay attention and or give money so that you can restore the smelly stinky snail, right? <laughs> so, uh, so oftentimes focal um, organisms, particularly organisms that um, have high uh, public appeal and or are rare are oftentimes an important motivator um, to do restoration. And increasingly one that we haven't really done very much. And our Ormond Beach restoration that we're working on is still, I'm sure we'll be planning it for another 20 years, the rate we're going, but, but the Ormond Beach restoration is one example of a restoration that, that is specifically taking climate change into account. Increasingly in the future, we'll, we, um, we're just starting to see this, but you know, over the next couple decades, more restorations designed to ameliorate some of the worst aspects of climate change. So in other words, we could imagine a critter that maybe has low mobility, can't just run around everywhere, and can only go a little bit of distance. Maybe we um, realize that 
the habitat for that critter is changing or, or, or the historic habitat will no longer be its habitat in 50 years or something say right so maybe what we want to do is go restore some of its habitat or or something at least that would function as its habitat in another area so that we could either actively transport that that critter there or make it so that its its offspring could eventually you know somehow get there or what have you so so those are all possible motivations for um for restoration Questions? Make sense? Okay. Um, the challenges with restoration, as you will see over the course of the semester, um, are legion. This is not an easy thing. This is not an easy thing. Uh, a few, a, a very small list, but just to get us going, get your brains going, a few of the challenges include things like um, massively fragmented landscapes. That is now, in places like California and, and much of the world, that is the norm. There is no more norm of a big, massive forest that's doing its forest thing, and then we have a little city on the edge of it. We also have many constraints on, on the political structures, the, the land use uh, governance structures that, uh, that set the table for where we might do our restorations. So for example, um, we have um, um, people that maybe don't want us to do a rest. Maybe this is a, uh, an old industrial site, right? And maybe we want to restore it and maybe people say, okay, yeah, you can put a wetland here, do this and that. But then, hey, whoa, maybe the town council says, Yo, 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 right? We get tax revenue from those businesses that are there, or the whatever, the, the light industry that's there. You want to put a wetland in there? How the heck are we going to get money for that? They say, oh, maybe some tourism and this and that. But, but you know, the, the, real, the real challenges. So um, the, the expectations that, that come along from um, people's previous experience with that, that area, and that oftentimes they want to keep that going. Those laws, those that income, what have you. To do it right on anything other than a small patchwork area, to do large scale restoration, we absolutely have to do this in an interdisciplinary context. So uh, sometimes in ESRM we do so many things interdisciplinary, sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't seem interdisciplinary to you, but, but compared to the traditional way most people <coughs> approach this, um, we need to be interdisciplinary. Biology folks need to be involved. Depending if there's like some contamination, chemistry folks might need to be involved. Depending on if this is near um, a school, we might need to have some education folks involved so we can have opportunities for kids to be engaged. Uh, and and it, it just goes on and on and on and on. The old model, which was a, mostly a biologist, is, oh my gosh, my flowers are going away. Let's do something. Uh, you know, that was sort of back in the day. Now we know, oh, okay, we need a hydrologist that can do this, and we need, uh, you know, blah, 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 that can do that, and a blah, 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 that can do this, and, a blah. and so, so really to be effective, we need to be interdisciplinary. We'll talk about the modern consulting industry that really runs, uh, at least in the U.S., and, but for that matter, much of the world, that runs restoration efforts, and there's been a huge change, and I'd say not for the better in recent years, where most restoration firms have been sucked up into engineering firms. And they have an engineering mindset, typically, which um, I would offer is not uh, necessarily good. Um, not that engineers are bad, but, but uh, we really do need a, a true interdisciplinary approach. Um, OK, so then there's, as with all of our resource management challenges, oh, man, would you like to put up this pretty building? Yeah, I would do that pretty building. Awesome. Hey, would you give me money to pay the janitor to clean the toilets? Nah, it doesn't sound interesting. I'd like my name on a building, right? <laughs> so that's this perennial problem that, that as challenging as it is to get the money to do that, to, to say acquire the land or, or, or do the initial activity, it's really, really hard to do the day in, day out, non-sexy, boring, in and out maintenance that's required for, uh, in many cases, for a healthy functioning system. <clears throat> Not every single restoration needs active management, but increasingly in our, in our 
fragmented and, and degraded systems, we do need a lot of help. And, and so finding that long-term ability to keep this effort going is far from trivial. And it's very, very easy for people to get burnt out, get, get uh, exhausted. Um, so you might put all this work in and get this restoration going for, you know, it might take 10 years and it's up and running and it's going for three, four years and then you get burnt out, right? And then it's possible that the, the whole thing collapses or at least much of it collapses and uh, the value that you've brought. So, so long-term maintenance is a non-trivial thing. And as, we've, as I mentioned on the previous slide, this notion of uh, thinking of these much more as functioning dynamic systems. What's that? Is there a question? Oh. Uh, uh, functioning dynamic systems, uh, sometimes that includes introducing things that people might find scary. Indeed, a lot of the increasingly, at least in the Western US, this involves um, putting in things that our society has actively decided it doesn't like things like predators, things like fire. And so, so to go down that road, you not only have the existing, um, existing challenges, but you also really need to get people to buy into something that maybe they're not super excited about. Right? I can't tell you how many questions. So when I was younger and mostly was underwater, the most common questions you know, at Thanksgiving dinner or, or at a party. So my neighbors, uh, one of my neighbors has having a birthday party this weekend, so we're going to go to, and I guarantee there's going to be other people, oh, go talk to the professor, go talk to the professor. Oh, OK. And, and, and if they're young, if they're young people, the question is, oh, so my daughter really wants to be a marine biologist. How can she be a marine biologist? And then we'll talk about dolphins and volleyball, because they usually really like volleyball and dolphins. Um, <laughs> but increasingly, now that I'm an old dude, and, uh, and work on land and stuff. Um, the most common question of late is, oh my God, have you heard those coyotes? Oh my God, we lost our cat. I think the coyote ate him. <laughs> and I have to say, no, coyote probably didn't eat your cat. Um, could have, possible, but probably didn't. So, so people really want to get rid of the coyotes. How do we get rid of the coyotes? How, 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 how. So that notion, that, 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 that's a key example of the first step, right? Before we go down this huge road of, of acquiring money and planning, we need to make sure that the community is going to have support. Because as we'll tell stories, I'll tell stories over the course of the semester, we have lots of examples of where you don't get community buy-in and the whole thing craps out. The whole thing craps out. So, so don't even start down that road until you've also started down the road of, of true buy-in. And to be truly collaborative, that might lead to you changing your plan. It, it, you know, we should not be this arrogant restoration ecology crew it says, hey, ignorant folks, let me tell you what you need, right? <laughs> what you can say is, hey, I've studied this a lot. I've worked on this quite a bit. I have some good insight. Um, one thing we should, we, we probably want to think about doing X. What do you think about that, right? And enter into a true conversation, not me, not me passively listening and checking that off the box that, yes, I listen to you, but truly engaging. So there might be things that we can do that maybe in, the, in your ideal world you wouldn't do, but nevertheless would radically increase the community buy-in, the stakeholder buy-in, and therefore lead to increased restoration success. So, um, so I just say that that's non-trivial. That's non-trivial. OK, and last time I had you guys throw up some, some ideas and, and you know, why might we want to do it. Um, here's the definition from the Society for Ecological Restoration. This is the professional society that most uh, you know, academic-y, professionally uh, oriented restoration ecologists are members of. It used to be called, the, so it used to just be, it was an American thing, and now it's an international uh, entity. But the Society for Ecological Restoration, so this is uh, a definition that they have proffered, which is ecological restoration is the process of assisting the recovery and management of ecological integrity. Ecological integrity includes a critical range of variability in biodiversity, ecological processes, structures, regional and historical context, and sustainable cultural practices. Again, very different from the original uh, definitions that were uh, put forward a few decades ago. This is a much more inclusive of a lot of different folks, of a lot of different potential goals and, and management targets, and that's important. So all of this falls within the purview of ecological restoration. Uh, 
Uh, a similar definition, this is from a Northern Arizona University, which has a great forestry program and, and has done a lot of mostly uh, forest restoration, but, but they have a, a, a long history of forest uh, restoration, particularly on Western lands. And so their definition uh, is uh, ecological restoration is a broad conceptual framework for helping ecosystems recover more nearly natural structure and function. Again, these are foresters. These are folks that are um, absolutely sort of from the utilitarian school. We're not, we're not restoring trees for the sake of trees. We're restoring trees because we can get some benefit from them, right? And so, so much more of this uh, notion of nearly natural, right? Continued use. So, so this acknowledgement that we're not shooting for some, in this case, for some maybe perfect idealized thing, but rather perhaps a more realistic uh, type of uh, end game. Uh, for ecological restoration to proceed on sound scientific footing, it must be rooted in the best knowledge available with carefully reasoned analysis checked against factual evidence. I like this definition because of that notion of checking. Don't, so we'll spend some time later today, but also throughout the semester looking at examples of, uh, that would be cool, let's do that, right? Like, uh, well, did you, have you ever read anything about that? Or have you ever tried that before? And so ecological restoration has historically suffered from that, that problem of not massively evidence-based decision-making or, or design. Um, okay, good. So this is, I think, our most important figure for the class. This is a classic figure, and, and you guys have some reading or will have some reading on this. Um, and, uh, and so people have critiqued this, but I really like it. And so there, there, there are critiques to be made. But, but I think, especially for you guys in an introductory theoretical class, this is the key thing you should have in your mind. This is what I have in my mind when we talk about ecological restoration. So let's spend a, a couple moments here, and let me just orient you to this. So on the <coughs> x-axis, we have time. This is arbitrary time. Could be days, could be weeks, could be months, could be decades, whatever. Some measure of time. Going from uh, right now or, or, or back in the day on the left side to some point in the future on the right side. Okay, that's that axis. The other axis is um, whatever you want to pick. So I usually talk about ecological function, but it could be species richness, it could be whatever. Okay, some measure of the ecosystem. Most typically, we would say something like species richness, let's say, right? So that generally speaking, the y-axis would go from the low, would go from low right here to some high level right here, right? But that, and, and, I, and just as you're starting, go ahead and think about that, but realize it could be something else. So if, it, if we were worried about invasive species, we had a bunch of invasive species that actually boosted the diversity this is the species richness, let me say, of our, of our grassland, maybe ecological function would be to lower that diversity potentially or, 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 or something or other. The point is it's some measure of complexity going from the goal level, the target level up here, uh, from a de versus a degraded level down at the bottom. Okay? Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a look at this. Let, let's walk through this. So um, this is what we think Okay, so we're starting off right here with where it says degraded state. So that's what we're starting with. That's the Walmart parking lot. That's the, that's the area after the fire has come through or whatever, okay? Defined as a degraded state by our axis, by this, by, by whatever our measure is. Mm, reproduction of rabbits, okay, whatever, whatever that thing is. So low level. Our goal is after... Uh, sitting around talking about and, and figuring out our goal is ah let's let's go here right we want to get to a high level of functioning of rabbit reproduction species richness what have you so essentially the green arc here now there's a bunch of theory as to how does that does that, does that thing go like this shape is it a linear shape is it log linear you know whatever but but the point is you go from some degraded state and at some point over time through actions that we take that you take we shove this functioning up to a better place. That's ecological restoration. Or I should say, that's idealized ecological restoration. That's what we'd all like to happen. It virtually never, ever, ever, ever happens that way. 
Um, usually, usually the best that we can hope for is to, uh, with, with our with our current practices at the scales that we would like to be operating at. Uh, we usually start this off and this thing goes and the best thing is, oh yeah, things get better and better and better and they don't quite get as good as we like, right? But they get to some, some improved level, okay? Maybe we didn't eliminate all the invasive species, but now the invasive species are only 5% of the biomass, something like that, let's say. So that would be, I would call that an, alt an alternative state. Another very common possibility could be we start and everything's getting better. And, oh my God, great. And then when the guys are, are driving the tractors around and they're planting all their plants and they're doing all this and that, and it's like, okay, it's great. It's going great. And then after they stop doing it and, and, uh, and they stop doing it and the, and the plants are still growing and this and that, and then they all leave and the first year is still okay. And then after that, it starts to decline. It starts to decay. So maybe those plants were doing okay because we were watering them, right? Maybe we put a sprinkler system in initially to help those little baby plants germinate and everything and get them through the first, you know, driest summer or whatever, and that's great. And now, okay, everybody signed off, turn off the sprinkler, right, because the developer doesn't want to pay for it anymore, and then now those plants all die. You know, some, something on that, that scale. Um, so uh, we could have that and, that, and that decline could be to the previous state. So in effect, it didn't get any better. Or it could, uh, which is bad, we don't like that, right? It could also go to get even worse, right? So it could not only not change, it could, it could keep going worse and worse and worse and worse. Indeed, in many of these systems, were we to do no restoration, they would probably continue to get worse. So, so that's sort of the conceptual layout. So when you think about ecological restoration, these techniques, these approaches, we're trying to go from degraded location to, or, or degraded state space to the desired state space. Cool? Make sense? All right, cool. In restoration, uh, as with any academic discipline, certain people, because it seems like certain people like to uh, invent terminology uh, to use to describe what they do in that, over the course of their activity. Um, so, I don't typically use these terms, but I just want to put them out so you guys uh, have them. Um, and, and it seems like every year there's, some, there's another variant or this or that, and people get very, very, you know, get their underwear balled up because, oh my God, this, thing, this is defined like this. Um, but I mention these because they do, um, I think, point to an important concept, which is that not every single restoration is like every single other restoration. Not every single restoration needs the same amount of uh, intense modification as do other restoration efforts. So, for example, let, let, let's talk about this. So, um, reclamation. And again, this is, make sure you put in your notes that other people use similar terms and, and the Australians have a way of talking about this. And so, so it is confusing. But again, this is for the sake of our argument for our for our class so that things make sense. We could talk about something that many people refer to as reclamation. This would be something that would be on our graph here, taking it to uh, maybe not all the way back to a, a pristine condition or the full functioning condition, but something that, that will work, essentially. Gives you type. Um, so a lot of times reclamation uh, might be on, say, something like rangeland, something of that nature, where we want to improve the the functioning or the condition, but in many cases the area is so nuked, is just so tweaked. Maybe the propagule supply that would be adding the seeds into the seed bank to maybe, let's say, boosting the vegetation community. There, there are no there are no native seeds around, you know, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, we're not going to be able to restore a full pine forest here, let's say, but we might be able to get a a, a Nat a grass meadow where natives are, are quite common, right? And everybody would say, hey, that's better than this messed up field. So for example, the Bundys, the, the folks that did the crazy standoff in Nevada a few years ago, um, and then whose children went up to Oregon this past year and did more strange things. Um, <laughs> those guys have run roughshod over the BLM land that they have operated on, on your land, on your public land, 
and not paid you any fees for the last 20 years. And there's a suite of stories just came out in the last uh, few weeks, a month or so, um, about how massively degraded that area is. Native American uh, artifacts destroyed, lots of graffiti, everything shot up, cattle everywhere, cattle down in the, in the streams. So when you have an area that's hyper, hyper nuked, say in a situation like that, maybe this notion of doing full scale restoration, maybe that's not a reality. A reality because of the physics of the system and a reality because of perhaps the, the, the funding situation, the funding reality as to where we can get um, the resources to and do that. So that'd be something more like reclamation. So make things better, but we're not, not shooting for a pristine system. Rehabilitation, or a similar term, would be the notion of, um, of uh, getting us, getting certain aspects back. So in the case of rehabilitation, that would be something, uh, most typically something like, um, uh, we want there to be better grass productivity. So, so we're kind of focused on one element of, of the community and, and really focusing on that, that one particular element. Restoration would be the full, in the, in the context of these terms, would be the full everything, right? Yeah, we're trying to get all the natives here. We're trying to get all the, the species complement there. We're trying to get the functioning going on. We're trying to get the energy processes going on, all that kind of stuff. So restoration would be, uh, in this spectrum of reclamation to rehabilitation to restoration, restoration would be the most intense or the, or the most challenging uh, thing to do. Um, other terms uh, that you have seen are things like, uh, you will see are things like enhancement, which is similar to some of these other things we've talked about. Um, uh, and then, but another one I'll just highlight is creation. So restoration, typically, and, and so, so all of these things can fall into the purview of ecological restoration, but restoration is typically thought of as, here this thing is messed up, it got messed up, let's, let's take the messed upness away. Let, 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 let's repair it. Creation would be taking something that was not a wetland and making it a wetland, for example. Um, and so why might we do that? We might do that because we have an endangered species, an endangered frog, and all of its habitat is nuked. And we need another spot for that frog, but all the places where it used to live are, um, are, have been destroyed, outright destroyed. So we might want to therefore restore a pond somewhere else, even though that's better deemed creation. But we might put that pond in that place and that can bring a lot of challenges because maybe there wasn't a wetland there historically. Maybe that means wetlands don't naturally want to be there. So, so creation is a lot harder. In the process of doing restoration, um, there's all kinds of other things that uh, come along. We, we've touched on this a little bit, but just to be clear, um, we have to first do this assessment. Do we even need to do the restoration? Why do we need to do the restoration? So, um, uh, you know, what's the problem here? So we want to first go in and document what that problem was. Um, and, and most proximally, that, that would include something like doing an inventory, an ecological inventory. So counting the critters that are here, measuring how much erosion is, is happening, that kind of stuff. And then oftentimes, some type of qualitative description of the, of the situation. This is, this is a, um, you know, a flat area, and, and uh, we need to make it not be flat. Um, and a lot of times that'll include what humans are currently doing on the landscape or could potentially do. Then we get to the key part, which is um, probably, probably the most important part, or, or at least one of the, the, the area that many people often screw up and often is directly um, the reason why the project fails. And that is goals and objectives. Too often, we don't spend enough time to spell out very detailed goals and objectives. There's a lot of reasons for that. First, it just might be, hey, if I say I want 349.7249 uh, grams of grass produced per the people are like, what, right? So, so clearly all these things need to be a mix of sort of a bit general but then, but then specific. The problem is so often people s 
it's only stick at the general level. We want to get rid of all invasive species. <laughs> right? Uh, that's okay, cool. How the hell are you going to do that, right? Over this thousand acre area. Right? Really? Are you really think you're going to do that? So your goal of the project is to get rid of everything that's not that wasn't here 150 years ago. Really? Wow. Okay. Um, you know, how about that exactly? Versus someone that says, hey, we like to have in the first five years a halving of the biomass of non-native species. And these five most problematic guys, we'd like them to not be anywhere, right? That gives you something to focus on. Hey, these, these things that are relatively easy for us to see, and we know they outright poison our ducks or whatever it is, let's, let's send guys through the forest and kill those things, right? And then, okay, that's the first goal. And then after that, maybe we'd like to reduce the non-native cover to 30%, you know, so stuff like that. That's the key thing, and, that's what's, and that takes a lot of work. So I can't tell you how many committees I sit on, and we go to meetings, and we just talk, what should this be, right? And, and it's hard, right? It's really hard when you don't have a lot of data, when you don't know what the climate, what the change climate is going to be like in 20 years. It's, it's hard to be specific. And so people have oftentimes defaulted to not being specific and to be general. Because then when, when, when stuff hits the fan, they're like, hey, OK, well, hey, it wasn't my fault. Right? I would argue that we need to be specific. And even if it fails, which I hope it doesn't fail, even if it fails, we can know why it failed. Without that specific guidance and those specific criteria, it becomes a whole lot of arm waving. It becomes a whole bunch of pretty pictures and PowerPoints and people waving their arms and saying, oh, it's just so, we're so unlucky. Right? We can't afford that. We, we can't afford to keep behaving that way. Um, and that's, again, oftentimes how it happens. Uh, a lot of this includes ecological triage. We have to prioritize. We cannot, unfortunately, it would be great if we could have grabbed everybody off the Titanic. We only have so many lifeboats. I wish that weren't the case, but it's true. And there's going to have to be some picking and choosing in almost all projects, almost all projects. And that sucks, and you should go have a beer at night and <laughs> wail and yell. But the reality is you have to, we have to pick. And, you, and restoration ecologists need to get, um, if not content with, at least comfortable with the fact that that's part of the gig, right? We're, we're literally in an emergency room operating on patients coming in. We can't sit there and send them to a research university hospital for 20 years to figure out what's going on. We have to go right now. And if you do not, by choosing not to engage in that, that's also a choice. So by choosing not to engage in triage, you're basically saying, we're going to let things continue on the way they're going. We're going to let that degradation keep going. We're going to let those species disappear. We're going to let whatever happen, happen. So triage is a key part of this and prioritizing actions. Um, and, then, and then we're going to go in and we're going to say, OK, so he, here's our goals. And, and, and these are the things we hope to achieve. We're going to prioritize. This is the most important one, et cetera. Then we've got to come up with designs that, um, that will, will help us achieve this, um, this outcome. Um, and, and, and then do the actual building and the, and the actual physical doings of things. After that's done, we then need to come on in and monitor. Now, when I first started teaching, so I taught the first restoration ecology class at UCLA, I taught the first one at Stanford, uh, taught the first one here, obviously we're brand new, so that's not a big deal. But, but, but in all those places, over that time, things have gotten a bit better. Things have improved. But still, we still have this thing with yeah, monitoring, I don't know. Right? I don't know. <laughs> and so if we're talking about wetlands, it is increasingly common that many folks require a three to five year, mon so you finish the restoration, and then post-restoration, something like a three to five year monitoring uh, period. It's going to depend on the agency. It's going to depend upon the site, et cetera. But that's, that, that's become fairly common in, in many places. But in many other locations, in many other systems, that's, that's still a lot of monitoring. And in systems outside of wetlands, that's, we, we, we rarely have longer term monitoring. We probably need 10-year, 20-year, 30-year monitoring, right, to really understand the trajectory of these systems. And what you'll find is the most responsible consultants um, uh, 
do this uh, on their own dime. So they might, they might not do a full scale restoration, a full scale monitoring assessment, but they might go back once a year and look at their project. Hey, how's it doing? Are the trees still there? You know, that kind of stuff. And, and uh, so it's not that folks don't think it's important, it's just that oftentimes it's not the legal requirement to do it, which means people won't do it, or there's not the, the fiscal or the resource base to support that. But um, you guys should acknowledge at this level that it's important to keep doing that, it's important to keep monitoring and know what worked and what didn't work, so that next time we can avoid what didn't work. Right? We don't want to do it just to keep you guys employed. We don't want to do it just to do it. We want to do it because we want to keep getting better. So it would be just like running the mile and then not looking at your time. Oh, yeah, hmm. Go back and run it again. Like, wait a second. Maybe we should think about a different stride. Maybe we should think about a different position that we start from. And that might lead to us uh, uh, running a better race. Obviously, maintenance is a deal. So maintenance for stuff that we expect, but then maintenance for things we don't expect. Maybe a hurricane comes through. Maybe a wildfire. Yeah, Hayden, sorry. Um, for like the monitoring part, like, does it have to be by the head, like, growth monitoring, does it have to be the whole agency, or can, say, like, an undergrad student come by and do, like, At this point, anybody could do it. In fact, so I was on a uh, state panel with some of my <laughs> colleagues, and we just wrote a paper that I'll probably share with you guys about um, coastal, uh, um, managing the coastlines. California's coastline, and one of the key to one of my uh, old mentors, uh, he was a grad student when I was an undergrad, he's now the chair of the biology department at UC Santa Cruz, he um, strongly believes that all monitoring should be done by third parties. Meaning, meaning so, so, so the classic example would be um, Southern California Edison has a, has a power plant, right? And they're, they're done with the power plant and they're gonna pull the power plant out. And then, and then by agreement, they said they were gonna restore the, the whatever, the dunes where the power plant was, let's say, right? So there's, the, there's the, the entity that actually had the impact and or is doing the recovery, right? Then there's the, the agency, the, 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 the person telling them they have to be doing it, let's say California Department of Fish and Game or something like that, right? So my colleague would say, monitoring should always be done by a third party. So yet another, and that could be a university, that could be another consulting firm, but the point is they don't have any skin in the game, right? So, so it's a tough thing when you're, so, you know, I'm in academia, we're in academia, right? And so I can go, the rest of the sucked, right? And then I come and I teach you guys the next semester, right? And then I just keep going. If I'm in a consulting firm, and my whole shtick is, I'm a great restoration ecologist. And then I go out and I look, and my, my restoration isn't 100% perfect. Uh, that kind of, that's a challenge, right? Because when I go in to bid for the next contract, you better believe it that the other um, re uh, restoration firm is going to be saying, hey, 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 I'm the best ever. I know how to restore wetlands, right? And if you said, if you said hey, we're super good, we get 90% success rate, right? The, the client it doesn't know much about restoration probably, right? It's a homeowner or a, a business owner. Like, I don't want the 90%, dude. I want the 100%, dude, right? So there's this built-in incentive system that's not necessarily nefarious, but, it, you know? So, so for reasons like that and other reasons, my, some of my colleagues have argued strongly that it should always be a third party doing the monitoring. As to who that third party is, it doesn't particularly matter. Um, uh, I, I think... Um, in most cases, people are desperate for any data. So if an undergrad is doing it, I think that's great. I think most people would say it's probably better to have a, a professor doing it and or better to have a consulting firm doing it just because they have more experience doing whatever. But, but honestly, any, any information um, in most cases is better than nothing. Other questions? Okay, good. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, where was I? Uh, so then, um, okay, then another key thing that we'll, we'll touch on in this class is incredibly important and nobody ever does, which is adaptive management. So the other thing, so the, one of the reasons, one of the main criticisms of this figure is that it's static. This assumes there is one degraded state and there is one perfect exploding green, I don't know what the hell that is, green, green sponge, spiky ball, right? The reality is Stuff is changing, right? Changing because of climate change, changing because of human fragmentation, changing because of just changing, 
a volcano went off or something, right? And so, so we should have in our restoration toolkit designs, plan for, expect things to change and have some contingency plans when they change. What's this? What is this? This is called, oh, I don't know, farming is what this is, right? A farmer wouldn't sit there and say, hey, I'm going I'm to put down my fertilizer in October <laughs> and I'm going to cut this on January 1. No, they're not, right? They might have a, a rough goal that, hey, we're probably going to put it down at this time. We're probably going to harvest at this time. But when they get, start getting close, they walk around, they kick the dirt, and they go, hmm, oh, no, it's not, not so much rain this year. We're going to wait three more weeks before we harvest. Or, oh, my God, we need a lot more nitrogen on this, on this thing, right? They're going to adapt their plans. So this is, this is just what humans have been doing forever. Um, but because of the legal framework and all this other stuff that's that sort of part and parcel grown up with um, ecological restoration, there's this notion of, I will do this on October 1, right? And the agency's <laughs> like, did you do this on October 1? And it's really hard. So, th so the story I always tell about this is this was years ago, and it was, I was at a conference in Florida um, where we were talking about uh, restoring the Everglades, right? So big, huge wetland, uh, one of the most amazing wetlands on planet Earth that we've essentially destroyed so that we can grow sugar. Um, and people in Miami can dance a lot and drink water. Um, but um, uh, plan to so the Army Corps of Engineers, as we'll hear about shortly, uh, replumbed that. And they said, we don't like nature putting water where it goes. We want to make water go where we wanted it to go. And so they, they, we screwed up the whole Everglade system, the so-called sea of grass. So a few years ago, it made a lot of news. And a few years ago, man, it was more like probably 15 years ago now, um, but uh, actually longer than that. Uh, I'm old. Um, uh, so a federal bill, a congressional act to restore the Everglades. So all this money was coming in, you know, billions of dollars to, uh, to uh, as incentives to acquire land, this and that, and everything. So this guy gives this big, huge talk, very smart guy, great talk. This is what we're going to do. This is the plan. Da -da -da. And he keeps saying adaptive management, adaptive management, adaptive management, adaptive management. And he's showing all these slides, and the slides are like, and, nine, and you know, 2000, we're going to do this, and 2005, we're going to do that. And I was like, where's the adaptive management part of that? And so, so he finishes up his talk, and you know, every claps and everything, and then we had a break. And so I went up and, and uh, spoke with the gentleman, and I said, yeah, so I got a, I got a question. Um, I'm just, one of the key parts of your plan, you said, is, is, is adaptive. He said, yeah. I said, well, I didn't see the points. Because in adaptive management, what we typically have is we'd say, hey, our goal is X. But at some point, whatever, every five years or whatever, we'll, we'll do a reassessment. If we're not at X, we're going to go down path Y or Z, right? We'll, 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 ch we'll change stuff. And I said, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't see the alternative pathways. Like, where were the decision points? He goes, oh, no, no, we're, we're, not, we're, not, uh, we're not changing how we're going to be doing the restoration. I said, I was very young and naive at the time. I said, well, well, but you said adaptive management. He said, yeah. Um, I think I call it adaptive monitoring. So we might change what we monitor over time to figure out you know, what's happening. And I said, well, OK. Uh, but um, you said it was adaptive. I said, <laughs> let me explain something to you, man. Do you think, uh, how many scientists are there in Congress? I said, I don't know. He said, not that many. And he said, so you want to tell them you want to do an experiment on the, at the scale of the state of Florida. That, that, you know, hey, can I have a billion dollars to do a big experiment? Do you think they would given a, have given us money to do that? Or would it have been more effective to say, hey, if you give us a billion dollars, we will restore the Everglades. And so what do you think we did? So, so the bill was very prescriptive and said, you know, da 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 So, so not, not, not to justify what happens, but, but that's the reality in which we live, right? To get the resources, to get the community buy-in or whatever to do these projects, a lot of times um, it's very easy to make these very specific promises. We will do X, and then we'll do Y, and then we'll do Z, and, and we need to be more mature than that. We need to say, hey, we're, we're generally going to do this and this. We might need to tweak it along the way. We might need to adjust. We might need to change course. So for example, maybe we're trying to restore bird populations, right? And the notion is, hey, give us some money, give us a million dollars, and we're going to restore some wetlands so the birds have more places to nest. And we start going through, and we find, actually, the nests are OK, but there's all these 
damn corvids. All these crows are eating all the chicks. So instead, I'm going to take that money and give it to hunters with, with rifles to blow away all the crows. Right? That's a better example of adaptive management, right? Because that's like, what's the goal? The goal is to restore the bird or endangered bird population, right? That's the goal. The goal isn't to make pretty grass or anything else. That, if, that, if that is the goal, um, adaptive management might include some, something like that. And you can imagine what the, what the public would feel. They said, oh, we're going to make a bunch of pretty grass. OK. No, actually, we're going to start shooting guns around. And, and you know, they're like, what? You know, are you kidding me? So, but adaptive management, though, that's, that's the aspect that we need to um, increasingly talk about and, and figure out. Uh, this is um, uh, some stuff from the, 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 the intro stuff that you guys are reading here. But this notion of um, many factors. You know, I hate these. I hate these like engineering diagrams and stuff. Like, I, I never understand why the hell they they look the way they do. And there's like X's sometimes and circles, and I don't really get it. But 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 the concept is what's important here. To this right. So the notion here, as we've already said, there's all kinds of things that go into making a, a restoration successful. All kinds of things. And you get. And again, we've baked this in in many cases into ESRM, your ESRM degree. But that's not necessarily the norm for most people that are entering ecological restoration. They're typically coming from one particular um, perspective. So in general, um, if we talk about um, the values that we're, that we're bringing to the table, usually things go better when we have more ecologically oriented values, biocentric values, as opposed to, I just want to make more cows so I can harvest the cows and make more money. Um, in terms of things like social commitments, as we've said, the more buy-in, the more, the more our community is invested in supporting this, that's going to increase the likelihood of this project succeeding. In terms of data, the more data we have, the better. I have never, ever, 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 ever worked on a restoration where we had full data, ever. You call that species lists. You call that topography. There's, I mean, some play, some projects are better than others, but the default is, hey, Dr. Anderson, can you come? I want to talk about this project. Okay, cool. What is it? It's this is grassland. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah. So, what was the history of this place? I don't know. Hmm. <laughs> People used to hear, you used to farm here. Ah, oh, cool. What time they start? When they start farming? Oh, you know. So, so that kind of stuff. That's the norm. That's the norm. So, so with restoration. And I'm not saying that's okay, but, but the more data and knowledge we have on the history of the site, on the existing species composition of the site, on the whatever, the more data, the better. The more informed we can make a decision, the more, the more likely that decision is to lead to the outcomes we like. But increasingly, it becomes a judgment call. Again, I can't tell you how many committees I've been on, and the answer is, so we have very limited data. And then someone gives a talk on climate change, and so the hydrology is changing, and the answer is, so wait, what? And then it's always, okay, got to be done today by five. So what should we do? <laughs> right? So it all, almost always pushes towards the judgment spectrum. Uh, and it's just, we have to do that sometimes. But realize, you know, and we would call this best professional judgment, so you'd want people like myself or other folks that have done, that have you know, familiarity with this system or similar systems, so they have, you know, um, they're not just making, you know, a guess in the dark, but nevertheless, the more we can get away from that into pure, localized, rich data, the better. And then lastly here, just had, just is, is, the, is the, the tableau with which we're starting. So if we have an intact, healthy uh, desert that is all good, that just has a little bit of tweaking where some guy drove his truck over and knocked over some cacti or something like that, that's better than a totally nuked desert where people have been camping and destroying and burning and turning up the soil, the microbial crusts and everything for, for decades. And that's just the reality. So clearly, um, there's the ideal, ideal situation that's going to lead to the most likely um, successful outcome. But oftentimes, we're pushed away from that, that ideal because of just the reality of the situation. <laughs>